Good morning and uh, welcome everybody to another SARE event. Today we are going to wonder how fit is DSO regulation for a decarbonized Europe and, and the subtitle of the session is Empirical Assessment and Regulatory Pathways. The background to this uh, new SARE initiative is the dramatic acceleration of Europe's efforts to move to full decarbonation. When the European Commission first launched the European Green Deal in December 2019, it clearly led its commitments to address what was referred to as this generation's defining task. Now, one year and a half later, in the context of a hopefully forthcoming recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, the Commission has set up a series of concrete proposals to tackle climate and environmental challenges, which is known as the Fit for 55 package. This package covers a wide range of policies on renewables, carbon pricing, energy efficiency, hydrogen, etc. It emphasizes the fact that the pillars of the clean energy package that was in itself the fruit of a very long process will need to be reshaped. So far, we don't know the extent of the reform to come, nor the likely depth of the changes to be proposed. What it is clear, however, is that minus 55% is not just a couple of figures. It's a clear political signal that striving for decarbonization will affect the whole energy system and impact all actors of the value chain. European distribution system operators will play a key role in this new energy transition phase. This is so not least because speeding up electrification to reach the goals of the Green Deal is a process which will have a strong local dimension with the DSO at its heart. Acknowledging that DSOs will need to adapt to this new regulatory challenge, the SARE report which we published this morning and which we will discuss in a few minutes, explores to, to what extent today's regulation is equipped to face the challenges linked to decarbonization. Through an empirical analysis drawn from two parallel surveys of DSOs and the national regulatory authorities across 39 European countries, this study aims at assessing which will be the future role for electricity DSOs in the context of the energy transition. Will there be an evolution of the DSO from a traditional one-way network to an active two-way network? And if so, what is the optimal regulation which will be required? As we will see, the report provides an extensive list of recommendations for the way forward, highlighting the role for the new EU DSO entity, a series of future scenarios, and the need for further regulatory clarification to interpret and implement the clean energy package. We'll start the session with a, a 10 minute presentation of the empirical part of the report. This will be followed up by an initial 15 minutes to the table of our guest panelists. These are senior level representatives from the EU institutions and, and key players from industry and, and regulators and I will introduce them in a minute. And the second 10 minutes presentation will then focus on scenarios and regulatory pathways. And this will be followed by a 40 minute discussion of our panel. So before we start, I remind you a few house rules. This event is live streamed on SARE site, www.sare.eu and on SARE's YouTube channel. It will also remain on those sites for, for later viewing. And by definition, the chat and house rules are therefore not applicable. Second rule 
it's about questions, as is the case with uh, sales public events. Questions can be put, and also private events, by the way, <laughs> questions can be put to uh, the report authors and to the panelists through Slido using the hashtag SERDSO or QR code, which appears on this screen now. And finally, you can join the debate on Twitter using the hashtag slash SERDSO. So I'm now pleased to give the floor to uh, my friend and colleague, Monica Giulietti. Professor Giulietti is a research fellow at SER and also a professor at uh, Loughborough University. And uh, she will make her a 10 minute presentation of the, the study's empirical findings. Good morning, Monica. And the good floor morning, is Bruno. Good morning, Bruno, and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be able to share the result of this work that we've uh, carried out in the past few months with my colleagues, uh, Michael and Karim. I would first of all like to thank our sponsors uh, for the project. Uh, we have both NRAs and uh, DSOs uh, that supported us with this work. Um, Arera and Binetza, uh, Eon and um, Geode. And I would also like to thank the SER team, which as usual, has been extremely supportive. We have worked most closely with Alessandra, Max, John and Sofia, but I'm sure that there was a whole team uh, behind the scenes um, helping and supporting with the development of our report. Ha, ha, as Bruno has uh, briefly mentioned, I will guide you through the first part. Uh, this will be mostly a uh, description of our objectives that we set out to um, uh, investigate, features of the survey and our participants, and, uh, and then some brief description of the evidence we have collected. I will now ask for a minute of patience while I uh, attempt to share my screen. And I will move on with my uh, discussion uh, in a minute. So in terms of the objectives, um, we wanted to investigate um, whether we could uh, provide suggestions on how to regulate, uh, um, how to better improve regulations for the DSO in light of the, uh, just a moment, please. I'm need to actually activate the sharing um, in light of the um, evolution that the electricity sector is uh, um, under undergoing. Uh, we wanted to investigate whether there are directions in which uh, the current regulation, in particular the, the clean energy package, can be um, developed uh, in order to improve societal uh, welfare. Um, we set out to ask uh, three uh, key questions. Um, how uh, should um, the um, uh, system operating function uh, of the DSO be defined and, regulator, uh, and regulated? How can regulators and uh, uh, EU policy makers uh, learn lessons from the well-established regulation of DSOs, and what kind of support can regulators and EU institutions provide uh, to DSOs in this process of uh, uh, rather radical change and, and transition. Um, we uh, carried out this uh, investigation using three approaches. We have, uh, uh, first of all, uh, run uh, two parallel uh, surveys, uh, rather similar in content, um, for uh, address to NRAs and, and DSOs. Uh, we then look at a set of case studies of situations where DSOs have been more active than their traditional uh, role uh, involved with uh, uh, the network uh, facilities mainly, 
looking in particular at the promotion of um, electric vehicle in infrastructure, um, sector coupling, so uh, integration of local gas and electricity decarbonization, the promotion of flexibility markets, uh, the provision of information to facilitate long-term planning, and finally, uh, smart uh, energy system integration at the local level. And we've also then developed five scenarios related to these case studies, uh, where we thought that the role of the DSO uh, might be uh, particularly relevant. Uh, to give you just a, a brief description of our participants, uh, of our survey participants, we sent our two surveys to the 39 countries that are either member or observers uh, of CER. Um, we received 51 responses covering 20 countries. For now, nine countries, we have the responses of the DSO and their regulator. Um, and we had uh, overall 20 NRAs uh, answering our survey and 37 DSOs. Uh, also, uh, th I wanted to point out that uh, despite the fact that not all of the 39 countries were covered, uh, we are looking at DSOs and regulators that are involved with uh, about 125 million uh, customers and about, um, for, in terms of uh, D DSO uh, direct customers and about 225 million who are protected by the NRAs that responded to our survey. Um, and finally, just a brief description of who were the uh, DSO companies that uh, participated. So um, we have 17 countries represented by the DSOs uh, with uh, 39 responses. Of these, 15 were rather large uh, DSOs with more than 1 million customers. 15 were with customers between 1 million and 100,000. And finally, seven that we classed as relatively small DSOs with fewer than 100,000. We also had responses from two energy network associations, one from the US, UK, and one from Sweden. And in our picture here that you see represented, we consider them as large DSOs. So we go up to 17 overall in the picture. So in terms of the evidence that we've uh, been able to collect as, uh, as a result of carrying out the survey, um, we've identified what we think are some uh, clear and hopefully uh, useful um, um, pieces of evidence. So the move towards the, um, a more active role for the DSOs is still work in progress, both for DSOs and NRAs. And uh, there is limited evidence that we've been able to gather about uh, the commitment to an expanded role of, uh, for DSOs. Uh, in particular, if we look at the amount of market procurement for congestion management and reactive power, possibly with the exception of the UK, most of the DSOs that we interacted with have no competitive procurement. Uh, for these functions, for these services. And much of the activity that we have observed, and there, there's a lot of very interesting examples that we have been able to find out about, they are focused on trials, often at early stage and rather small. Um, DSOs identify a tariff structure and regulatory barriers as the most significant um, constraints in terms of developing a more active role for DSOs, why NRAs are co um, concerned about local competition uh, and the lack of potential providers um, for flexibility services, and also a lack of information about the state of the network. Um, in terms of uh, support that could be provided uh, for this uh, more active role, 
the answers we got with, uh, from DSOs and RRAs are not fully aligned in terms of the support that would be desirable or required. DSOs indicated that they would like more regulatory support and NRAs remain a bit uncertain about the potential role of, BS, of DSOs. Uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, the role of the new uh, EU DSO uh, entity um, can be quite useful in this context. They can learn from the experience of ANSOE and en enhance the role of DSOs across different countries and promote flexibility solution. But we perceived a potential uh, tension between providing a unified voice for all the diverse uh, DSOs across Europe and promoting sufficiently nuanced policies that reflect this diversity. Uh, in terms of the country comparisons that we carried out as part of our exercise, uh, we found that, um, sorry, in terms of the, of the knowledge that is uh, um, uh, available about uh, exciting and, and uh, path-breaking experiences, NRAs and smaller DSOs were less able or less willing uh, to identify projects that they uh, thought were worthwhile learning from. Only a couple of respondents actually mentioned examples that could be find, found outside Europe, despite the fact that there are um, leading examples, particularly in the US and Australia, um, relating to elements of smart grid, uh, smart grid development. But these don't seem to be known or uh, particularly relevant to the respondents to our survey. We then uh, finally um, developed a detailed comparison across six European countries, and we noticed that there are different speeds of uh, progress, uh, and um, we've identified some countries that have been making more progress. And um, our cross-country uh, comparison revealed that those countries where we have seen uh, a more dynamic environment seem to be associated with a more supportive uh, regulatory environment. Uh, I believe this is the end of my presentation and I'll be happy to take any questions at this stage. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Monica. I think this is extremely clear. It shows also, I think the, the ambition that uh, we, we had and, and, and I, I think that the the, the results of the, uh, the findings that you come up with and, and the number of respondents and the sheer size of the, of, of the sample uh, show that uh, uh, what uh, we can draw from this uh, is, is definitely bound to be relevant. Before uh, introducing the, uh, uh, the, the, first, uh, quick, uh, the, the first panel discussion, I just want to uh, complete the introduction that I made uh, and say that the authors of this uh, uh, report, uh, uh, Monica Giulietti, Michael Pollitt, and Karim Anaya, uh, whom uh, is present with us on this uh, web uh, uh, live stream. So um, I I'd like to, to, to welcome now and, and introduce our, our, our distinguished uh, panelists, and uh, I'll do so in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, so, uh, Sabine Kromer from uh, DG Energy, uh, European Commission. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning Bruno. And, and thank, you, thank, you, thank you for joining, Sabine. Uh, Torsten Knopf, uh, European Regulation from the Aeon Group. Hello, uh, Torsten. Are you with us? Good morning, Bruno. It's a pleasure good to morning. be here. Good morning, Torsten. Great to have you on board. Uh, Carmen Jimeno, Secretary General of Giod. Uh, good morning, Carmen. Hello, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for, for you attending and, and also for your support to, to this project, as, uh, um, as Monica mentioned, along with, uh, with Aeon and uh, uh, the, uh, the NRAs. Uh, and, and also, uh, we have finally Flo Silver uh, 
from uh, Ofgem. So good morning to you, Flo. Good morning. Hey, nice to be here. So Sabine, uh, representing the commission, you're going to be the first one I, I, I'd like to, to, to ask uh, a question to and ask you to come. And uh, if we, we see the survey that uh, Monica just presented, most of the, of the DSOs and the regulators who responded agree that further coordination between TSOs and DSOs is, is necessary. So in your view, what would, you know, which of the, of the following areas should be prioritized to reinforce such coordination? Uh, a clear framework defining roles, uh, planning or timing of, of investments uh, or, or data sharing uh, or anything else? We'd be grateful for your view on that. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. Um, so you mean the areas in which, uh, well, which are a priority for DSO and TSO to cooperate? I, I think maybe uh, as a general remark, uh, first, um, of course, we see the need um, for DSOs and TSOs to, to cooperate more closely in the future. This indeed comes from how the energy system is, develop, uh, is developing and expected to develop with increased electrification and which increased uh, share of renewables um, rela um, connected at the distributed level, which will lead to DSOs becoming more active. So once DSOs become more, more active, of course, this has a repercussion on, on TSO activities as um, well. Um, in a in a big um, network um, so this means that really it is key and it's really very important um, that dso's and tso's uh, coordinate on uh, several um, issues um maybe if you yeah just to shortly maybe also mention that in the clean energy package and the electricity directive and the electricity regulation, it you can find it in a lot of areas. Huh? You have particular explicit provisions uh, in the electricity regulation on TSO and the DSO corporation. You also have the creation of the EU DSO, which maybe like mirrors a bit the NSOE, which will give the possibility like to make a institutionalized, maybe if I can call it like this, a framework for DSOs and um, TSOs to cooperate together. And then you also see it in individual provisions where the, on DSO roles and responsibilities, where there are, for example, obligations to consult um, TSOs, uh, for example, in the network uh, planning. Um, coming to the areas, I think an important area we see you as it's also well, kind of a new area is like in this, uh, in um, regard related to flexibility and uh, demand response um, where the clean energy package provide that um, DSOs should be provided with incentives uh, to use flexibility services in particular to address potential congestion in their grid and there we see um, there, it, it's, this is an important area for DSOs and, and TSOs uh, to cooperate and coordinate and to make clear um, the different rules um, um, or the different yeah, roles and the not rules, different roles and different responsibilities um, of, of DSOs, TSOs, and also of the other other actors uh, involved. Um, in this context, of course, uh, data uh, play an important role as well. Exchange of data, um, well, DSOs, TSOs have to have at least a certain knowledge what is happening in the grid of the other um, party. Um, so this would also be a key um, area which uh, I would like would see. Um, so I stop here, maybe. Okay. For the moment. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sabina. Flo, uh, we see that the DSOs and the national regulators have got have got different views. Uh, uh, any reason for that from that you see? Um, I think it's it's really not surprising that um, the forgive me if I call them DNOs. Uh, we have a slightly different uh, terminology in the UK. It's kind of ingrained into me that we have distribution network operators who are seeking to become distribution system operators. Um, but I think it's um, perfectly reasonable to expect a, a network operator to have both the interest in their customers and the interest in having an efficient um, and economic network overall, but they are still um, ultimately a private entity. Um, and you have regulators who 
are looking ultimately to ensure that the best outcome for the end consumer is is what's ultimately achieved. So I think there's a lot of places where those two things can work really well together um, and a lot that can be achieved through that cooperation between regulators and network operators. Um, but there still is ultimately a slightly different focus in what each is trying to achieve. And I think it leads to a rather unsurprising difference ultimately in how um, the two groups might see the best um, outcome for the future of the networks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Torsten, uh, when, when you look at the, at the uh, survey results, what, what do you learn from, uh, from TSO and, and other regulation? And I'll, I'll, I'll ask the same question to Carmen uh, in a few minutes also. Torsten. Yeah, thanks, Bruno. I think the um, the most important or, or most interesting result, and, and the one that we could probably um, have a focus on of this study, is um, uh, not necessarily in the first place. Of course, there's there's a survey, and we'll come to that in the regulatory part um, of of the NRAs and the D DSOs. And there's a lot of interesting things in there. But I think even more interesting are the case studies and the scenarios, because these case studies and scenarios of the study they complement the survey. And they basically open the picture and say, um, what do we expect for um, a future active um, DSO? And um, which requirements have to be met? And then, of course, it contrasts that with the results of the study. And I think that there are quite a few important points in there. There's the question about the role of the DSO in the integration of, um, uh, well, actually in the, the ownership and operation of charging infrastructure and storage. Um, more importantly, um, there is the question about the, the integration of systems and the particular role of the DSO in bringing together um, electricity, gas, hydrogen, heat on a local and regional level. I think this will be crucial to the success of our, our decarbonization efforts. Um, there is the, the question and the scenario about um, which role an active DSO should especially take in view of um, flexibility market organization, flexibility data hub, flexibility management. I think that also is something that will uh, completely alter the landscape and transform the DSO into a much more active role than we have today. And of course, there's finally, and that's where it meets the survey again, um, there's the question of, um, of innovation. Um, which role should the DSO play in bringing forward innovation and facilitating innovation? Is there enough scope for the DSO to um, uh, have innovation? And is, it, um, is, is the active DSO also actively doing research and resulting in innovation coming from the DSOs? And if you put these together, if you put these, um, these case studies and these scenarios together and then um, contrast them with the results of the survey, then of course we see the big gap where we see, okay, um, uh, obviously, uh, there are things that TSOs do today already and where DSOs have in a different form to come to because they have to become more active and the role will change. And there's this, this gap between um, what is reality already, where we can go to and what we have to achieve. So I think a, a huge contribution of the study is painting the picture of which topics there are and what an active DSO should be and then bring that in contrast to the existing TSO situation and, of course, um, into what uh, we have as regulation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thorsten. Carmen, same question. Uh, your uh, takeaways from, from TSO and other regulation? Yes, thank you, Bruno. I think Thorsten did a very good uh, summary. I will try to add a little bit here. But um, I think what we we learn from the from the survey, I think that is that the, for the DSOs uh, to keep um, the role as a system operators is very important for them. So there is a, a, a willingness not to be a network operators only. So in that we can look uh, to our colleagues TSOs who actively manage. Uh, the, the system at the transmission level, of course, and, and we want to play a role as well. And the, and the current um, uh, clean energy package, so the electricity directive and the regulation uh, set up a very uh, important principles uh, for that. Uh, you see that the DSO is really in the focus uh, in comparison to the 
former uh, electricity directive, which was more focused on precisely on the on the TSO. But as the as one of the conclusions of this report, uh, we think that the, there is still room for regulation to develop and and still improve. Uh, to 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 make uh, it happens that the DSO really can develop as a, as a, um, as an active um, as an active um, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, more actively let's say because and I think it was you Bruno or, or Monica you mentioned that uh, the study reflects that those countries who are more uh, supporting from the regulatory point of view, the ESOs we see there, they are playing a more active role. This is clearly the case of, of, of the UK that uh, you authors uh, know, uh, know very well. Uh, but uh, but it's, of course, I mean, the, the clean energy packets was, um, well, the proposal from the commission was launched, remember, in November uh, 2016. It was, uh, let's say, pre cook as I call it, uh, in the years even before. So we were, talks were starting in 2014. It is well advanced for the moment uh, because this system we know with energy system is changing so rapidly. Uh, in, a, in a very disruptive way that it, it, it's not easy to really be such a visionary from the legislative point of view to foresee what is going to be needed, et cetera. So we think that, uh, and these scenarios uh, show that in some cases, maybe uh, some reviews will be needed to really uh, support the DSO to face the challenges which uh, the decarbonization um, are, are bringing up. Um, I would like to add maybe to the, it was the, the previous point, the TSO, DSO coordination, which we also, of course, see uh, crucial at this moment, maybe the importance of the area of the joint network planning. Uh, we think that this, um, and, 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 and here also linking to what we see from the TSOs, for, for which uh, the planning has been become very important. They also are the ones mandated at the, uh, by the regula electricity regulation to develop the 10-year network development plans. So the DSOs uh, should jump in also together with the TSOs on those. Uh, this is, uh, I think, crucial for also for the, if we want to achieve uh, the, the decarbonization targets uh, and also to do it in an efficient way for the system. And it's not only DSO, TSO cooperation, but also electricity gas uh, for the benefit of sector integration. And probably I just stop here uh, in terms okay, of thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carmen. Um, we have, uh, as you know, we, we uh, you have the viewers have the opportunity to put questions on Slido. We are receiving a number of questions. I got one here for, for, for Michael or Monica. Uh, perhaps, Monica, have you interacted with network customers as well? Are uh, we being asked? And if not, why? Why, why wouldn't have you have interacted with network customers? Monica or Michael? Um, uh, sorry, just to, to clarify, the question is why the survey wasn't extended to customers. Um, I think it is a matter of practicality, first of all, in terms of uh, uh, links, established links that we could rely on in order to sort of be able to um, target all the relevant actors in this uh, in this process and uh, have a high uh, likelihood that they would come back with answers. Uh, I think um, a survey of the public would have gone outside our um, regular uh, set of links and we would have had to ensure that we get over a broad number of potential respondents a representative set of respondents, both in the uh, business area, commercial, potentially local authorities, uh, and, and final consumers. It would have been a much uh, more demanding task. Um, already, we are a little bit concerned about the fact that we noticed that uh, the number of small DSOs that responded was rather limited compared to the large number of them throughout Europe. And this is possibly due to the fact that 
they haven't got the resources and the time uh, to devote to to this and we expect the, the, a broader target um, set of uh, participants would have ended up not being sufficiently rigorous and reliable on a sort of scientific uh, ground but maybe Karim and Michael might have other points to add I'm not sure oh, I, I thank thank you thank you very much uh, Monica um, what I what I understand is that uh, uh, in fact the, this question uh, offers us also uh, an opportunity uh, for an extension of this study and uh, and and further further endeavors in that directions and uh, no doubt uh, we'll be we'll be discussing that together internally uh, and I, I'm sure that uh, the interest that I can see already on this in this report on social network um, and uh, and in the questions that we get uh, shows that uh, there may be appetite for that but let's move to the to the second part of the of the presentation. On, on regulatory uh, regulatory pathways, I, I, I'll give the floor to uh, our uh, academic co-director uh, Michael Pollitt, uh, who will uh, uh, who will uh, who is a professor at, uh, at Cambridge, and uh, and Michael will present the his proposals for for optimal or the author's proposals for optimal regulatory pathways for European uh, DSOs. Um, Michael, the floor, the floor is yours. You could perhaps put your, your slides in, uh, in uh, projection mode. Uh. Okay, um, we've tried that. Um, thank you, Bruno. Um, I uh, am delighted to be presenting the second part of uh, today's session. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, what our study means for regulation and some of the points that we took away on that. Uh, and again, I want to thank um, our sponsors, and I also want to uh, particularly thank Kareem and uh, Monica, my co-authors, and the rest of the SAIR team for all the help that they give uh, with this project. Um, so, um, as Torsten has helpfully signposted, what we do in um, the report, as well as conducting these two parallel surveys, is we think about a number of scenarios which may be relevant to the future of the distribution system operator and think, well, what is the state of knowledge about those and how do they fit with the current clean energy package? Uh, and I think it's important to say that, um, as um, was already being said, that the clean energy package is now out of date. Um, it was drafted in 2015, 2016, and we've since moved to net zero. And net zero has major implications for the future of the uh, energy system in Europe. And it would be surprising if the clean energy package was the last word on the future of the DSO. Um, so that's the sort of spirit in which our report uh, is uh, looking at this. So we, we consider a number of um, scenarios and that does allow us to um, sort of ask some hard questions about the state of um, regulation in Europe with respect to these things. So the first um, uh, scenario we think about is, well, what if a government, uh, local, regional or national wants to install a large number of public charging points for electric vehicles? Um, could it just ask its distribution system operator to do this? You know, this is net zero, we need to move quickly. Um, and uh, well, it, it, it can't under the current electricity directive, um, not unless there are strict conditions satisfied. And that gives rise to a number of um, questions that regulators need to address to facilitate the rapid rollout of charging and the optimal use of public charging points. Um, and the literature is quite clear about the way uh, that uh, regulation might need to develop in this area. Um, a second case study might be um, uh, that national, regional or local government wants to coordinate its gas and um, electricity networks at the distribution system level. And Torsten mentioned this explicitly and also perhaps hydrogen networks and other future net zero networks. Well, actually, 
the direct the electricity directive is silent on coordination at the distribution level it does mention coordination at the transmission level between electricity and gas but not at the distribution level and there's no requirement on distribution system operators to work together um, to facilitate net zero and you know we're spending a lot of money on gas and electricity network distribution those that's regulated customer money and it's not being coordinated formally by regulation at the moment. Um, and so clearly there's a lot of work uh, for regulators uh, to do um, in that area. Okay, what about a third case study? And this begins to get to some of the heart of the, the commission's thinking about distribution system operators. So what if a single battery unit could resolve all the local grid management constraints at least cost and avoid um, the need for an expensive network upgrade. What is the role of the incumbent distribution system operator to deliver and operate that asset? And the, and the, the directive is, uh, the current electricity directive does, might allow that to happen, but there's definitely a push by both the commission and national regulators to make sure that there's competitive provision of uh, that sort of uh, local constraint management, even though there might be a single obvious solution, which would be best delivered by the distribution system operator. And indeed, we do see in our survey examples of where the distribution system operator is intimately involved in delivering such an asset. And again, some really clear thinking needs to go on on the part of regulators and not to be sort of wedded to a competitive solution, a fully competitive solution when there might be obvious least cost solutions available. Um, our fourth case study is about, uh, you know, local electricity state work stakeholders, in particular uh, distributed energy uh, resources, do want guidance on what the likely future development of the electricity system in their locality is going to be. And, and one of the big questions is how can that indicative planning be improved? Now the directive does, the electricity directive does um, promote uh, 10 year network planning. Um, but the question is how good is that planning at the moment? Because what we need is a very dynamic evolving plan which is also giving good information to uh, directors and indeed there are you know questions for regulators about how serious the plan the planning process is and when it whether it's really dynamic enough or informed enough to to give information to uh, distributed uh, energy resources and then our, our fourth our fifth and final question for the future of the DSO is uh, again one that uh, was being highlighted by our panelists you know um, an NRA or national governments do want DSOs to be more innovative and proactive in the energy transition but what exactly is the role uh, of the DSO in promoting bottom-up innovation and uh, this is something that was highlighted by the respondents to our survey you know, there is a lot in the electricity directive which uh, talks about innovation, but actually there's nothing on innovation funding mechanisms. Um, and so, so, you know, the commission talks about innovation, but actually um, are regulators encouraged to actually promote innovation? Um, and our survey highlights the role of uh, proper innovation incentives, regulatory sandboxing, and the fact that uh, a significant number of DSOs don't feel that they're getting enough support for innovation. Um, and it's clear from the international evidence that the jurisdictions, jurisdictions that promote innovation with funding and with funding mechanisms get more innovation um, and those that don't get less. Um, so these are serious questions that are raised, which do suggest extensions to existing regulation improvements to the current uh, set of directives that we have. So just to uh, draw out some high level conclusions that I think we can take away from um, both the surveys and the scenario analysis. Um, it's, it, it's still a work in progress. Um, there's a lot of ambition in the directives, 
Um, but actually, the move towards an active DSO is 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 rather slow, um, and there's little evidence that has progressed very far in in most jurisdictions, apart from perhaps the UK and maybe the Netherlands. Um, and uh, that would suggest a major role for the new EU DSO entity, because although there is a huge amount of experimentation going on and many projects in many European jurisdictions, actually there's very little knowledge about those projects outside uh, the jurisdiction or even within the jurisdiction. And there's a question about whether the, the information that's being accumulated in these projects is actually being shared or created or processed in a way that's actually going to be useful and doesn't represent a waste of um, consumers' money to the extent that this actually is being funded by consumers. Um, and there's clearly some misalignment between um, what NRIs think uh, is clear um, to the DSO and what DSOs actually want. Uh, to promote the future of the, of the DSO, so uh, and the, and the, the nature of our parallel surveys picks up this sort of apparent uh, you know dissonance between uh, between the two groups, which you know as Flo says, not altogether unexpected. So some clear areas for future development: um, the requirement for de electricity and gas. DSOs to cooperate, that is clearly something that needs to be worked on in the light of net zero and sector coupling. Um, there clearly does need to be some more thinking and clarification around the role of the DSO in storage and in charging um, uh, for electric vehicles. And, um, you know, much as I'm keen on what's happened on the, in the UK in terms of the massive amount of activity that's gone on with respect to the DSO, the large increase in competitive procurement in constraint management and the emerging uh, procurement for uh, reactive power. Um, it's still the case that the cost benefit of these things has not been proven at scale. And so competitive outsourcing by the DSO is something that really does need to be investigated quite carefully um, by regulators as to whether this actually is delivering benefits for uh, consumers and what types of procurement do uh, deliver benefits for consumers. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Michael. I'm I'm always uh, this is a personal note. Huh? I'm I'm always amazed by your capability of synthesizing masses of information and and and, and data and and draw from that uh, in ten minutes. Uh, what uh, what we what we need to 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 take away from it, and and this was also done by by Monica. So really, thank thank you very much to to, to both of you. Um, I I'd like to 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 uh, to turn to 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 a panelist, and 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 I, I got many questions coming in, but but I I got first a few ones that I I want to to hear from you. Clearly, we want to know what you think of this study, what you are. Uh, what are your views on the study? And, and, and there are several aspects which we could, uh, we could concentrate on. We could, uh, for instance, uh, talk about the new DSO entity. Uh, uh, I would ask, for instance, Toshton, uh, do you think, how, how do we ensure that, that the new DSO entity will, will support both the needs to decarbonize local grids and, and simultaneously enhance the, the necessary innovative frameworks within Europe. Michael talked about that, about the need for innovation. So uh, do you think that the, the, the DSO, the new DSO entity can do that and how? Uh, thank you, Bruno. I'm, I'm quite optimistic about that, actually. Um, if you look at the, um, the tasks of the DSO entity in the um, uh, in the um, regulation, you'll see that they, of course, um, are uh, um, have the task of drafting um, network codes and guidelines and they're one of the crucial ones of course is um, uh, the uh, hopefully upcoming network code on distributed flexibility because that will not only have a framework for the use of flexibility um, but it will um, that at least our hopes will also provide a push uh, to the dynamic development of flexibility and will unleash on co competitive dynamic on part of the market parties so this will really get forward the, the development
development of the active DSO. Uh, in the chat I've seen uh, present in, in this meeting and that you're following it um, has also asked about the other network code on cybersecurity. Um, but then, of course, apart from these, these legal activities, there's also a wide role of the entity. And I think that, that's where it comes into what you've been asking especially and saying yes we we, we draft um, uh, best practices for um, the integration of systems we draft best practices beyond the network code also on on further on flexibility we draft best practices on innovation we draft um, best practices on how to integrate um, um, uh, on how to integrate um, um, uh, uh, stor storage and um, uh, and EV charging. Um, that, that, of course, is, is very important. And the third point, um, indeed, is um, that I trust that the entity will um, uh, inherit where to innovate, how to innovate, what are the necessary topics. So I think the entity comes exactly at the right time. It comes at the right time um, to, to uh, accompany and push forward um, the moving of the... Um, um, uh, of the transformation to the active DSO. And let me just have one final remark, Bruno, and then I'm, then I'm finished. One final remark is, of course, gas. We see that we have an upcoming gas package, or however, however it will be called. And of course, we have the question, do we want to have an entity for gas? Probably not. Yes. Do we want to have it together with, with electricity? We'll have to see that. Maybe, maybe not. And that will, again, for system integration, give it another push. So there's a lot to do on a European level, and there's a lot to do for the entity and probably for the entities in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Torsten. Uh, Carmen, I was coming to you. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, you, were, you were the next one. Um, uh, clearly, same question, your view on the SO entity. Uh, but I have another one for you after that one. Claude, please go ahead okay. on, the, on your your view of the prospects of the of the DSO entity. Yeah, I think Dorsted uh, elaborate pretty well on the task of the UDSO entity, nothing else to add from my side, but maybe I would like to insist because there are some uh, comments uh, in the report a bit, uh, let's say, critical or not very optimistic on, on the role or how this entity will manage in future with such a, which is true, uh, diversity among the number of, of, of members of the UDSO entity. So I would like to to, to uh, say that uh, as regards the governance of the entity, which uh, much was already set in the electricity regulation, so there was not much room uh, to, <laughs> to let's do something different, but uh, the outcome of the statutes is uh, the result of very long discussions among more than a year, almost two years, uh, sitting together at the time when it was uh, possible among representatives uh, of the um, DSOs members from the four electricity uh, European DSO associations. And, and this, uh, um, the institutes ensured that um, all the diversity across DSOs in Europe is fairly represented within the entity uh, with equal opportunities. Uh, so, um, and well, this is, uh, it has been built on the basis of consensus, which is a uh, long process, you know, this is how Europe works as well. And this is why legislation takes a while. But uh, having said that, let's be optimistic. Uh, I think the, the, the first positive news is that, uh, well, even the first General Assembly will take place uh, early June. So this is reality. Uh, the UDSO entity is coming into place. It's going to be functioning pretty soon. And, and well, uh, the rules are set up for a good functioning. So then now is on the hands of all those DSOs, almost 900 DSOs as members, which is a huge success. We were not expecting so many members. And well, let's evaluate maybe in a year from now, but uh, I want to give a very positive message uh, for the future of this UDSO entity, which can play a critical role to enhance the voice of uh, distribu distribution system operators in Europe. Carmen, thanks. They're going to be massive investments, which are which are going to be needed to make to make sure that you know smart grids in 
in Europe will will deliver the uh, the electrification which is required to to decarbonize. Now, assuming we do not review the the current regulatory framework, can we expect those investments to happen? <coughs> Sorry, to happen in countries with with medium or, or small DSOs and. And I'll ask the, the view of the commission after that, of, of Sabine, but Carmen. Yeah, here I have to be a bit more pessimist <laughs> than with the UDSO entity, to be very honest. Uh, well, there are um, different figures. We, there is a recent study from Deloitte, uh, which uh, foresee or estimates around uh, 400 billion uh, euros investments from now until 2030 to uh, in the distribution uh, networks in order to face the challenges uh, if we want to um, go for a net zero in 2050. Uh, so it's clear that uh, we need, uh, um, uh, we have to improve in many countries the, the existing regulatory frameworks for DSOs remuneration. It's not about that DSOs ask for higher returns, et cetera, is that we need what we are asking is whatever the amount is, but it's uh, an optimal balance between uh, investments on conventional assets, but also on innovative ones, and also in um, how the, the services for uh, flexibility services will be remunerated. So the DSO can take the, when accomplishing investments, the most efficient decisions, uh, not because what is gonna be remunerated best, but because this is the most efficient solution. And this has to be uh, solved still in an um, important number of member states. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sabina, on, on, on the DSO entity and on the, on, on the link between the, the investments which are needed and the, and the need for, for, for review of the, of the regulatory framework. Can, can I have your views on that, please? Uh, yes, although I, I, I think uh, Carmen also from the regulators are very well placed also to answer on this because there's not so much I think on the on the EU uh, level, I mean, uh, we agreed and indeed uh, different figures have been um, around that a lot of investments will be needed for modernizing or upgrading the grid, but also for smartening the grid at the distribution level to, to integrate uh, new resources. Um, connected there. There was also a, a study from the commission, but it's uh, three years old, so it might not, not, not be uh, so up to date anymore, the figures um, there. But indeed, um, yeah, we see the, uh, the need there, the importance there. Um, maybe let me make a link here to, to the recovery and the resilient plans of the member states. Of course, um, there's a possibility for member states to use the, the money um, there, in particular for smart uh, grids. And this is also supported by the, the commission in, in the assessments. Um, we also have uh, um, the um, TNE, the, the Trans-European Networks um, for Electricity, where you also have a category of smart grids. And in the proposal um, that the Commission made for revising the TNE in, the, in December, this category is also further um, highlighted. Um, so um, I would like to make reference um, to this. Um, well, of course, you have the European Investment Bank who does uh, funding in this area as well. And well, you have, you talked about it, but it's a bit different. We also have the research and development um, for smart grids. There's quite some money which was spent over the last year. I think it was, uh, years was 1 billion in, over the last um, six years. Um, one point maybe again to the investments. I think that's where we see also, of course, investments will be needed, but we see the important role of um, using flexibility and, and flexible assets indeed to manage congestion at a distribution level because it's price demand to limit the amount of investments um, that will um, uh, will be needed. So it's important really to also have a look there and to use it uh, as much as possible to yeah, investments will still be needed, uh, but uh, to see that uh, to come to a most cost efficient solution on, on which areas to focus on. Um, so Sabine, this... if I may, I have one very specific question which is being put to you uh, yeah. from, from one of our, of, our, of our viewers. And he asks, how, how does the commission see the future cooperation between gas and electricity network operators at distribution and transmission level? Have you got a view that you can share with us on that? 
Yeah, I'm afraid. I guess some colleagues have. <laughs> it's not really my area of expertise. I mean, I can make reference to the um, energy system um, integration um, strategy adopted in September last year, where really the I think the Commission really takes a holistic approach to the energy system and, and doesn't want to address like really separately the different vectors, but for, for decarbonization and to get the energy system fit for the future, you really have to look at, at everything um, together. Um, so I think in this context also comes then, of course, always a need for, for cooperation um, between different actors and I guess then also between uh, gas DSOs and electricity DSOs. Um, yeah, maybe that's what I would like okay. to say. Thank you. Uh, Torsten, I think you're back with us. And, and the, the, uh, there, are, there are a few questions that are also coming from our, from our, from our members. Uh, one is asking from our, our viewers, and one is asking, what are your views on the responsibilities for DSOs to design and set tariffs uh, versus the regulators where DSOs need to be agile to promote, for instance, flexibility? Uh, I'm not sure that the question is 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 is, is, is do you do you understand the question? The the, the response. I, I think I think it, it yeah I think it pro probably is about um, the ability to to use tariffs to mobilize flexibilities is what we call implicit flexibility against explicit flexibility where you really buy products. Um, and of course, I, I think that wherever this makes sense, it can complement the explicit flexibility framework. And it has to be also to, to be acknowledged and admitted by uh, the regulatory framework. So um, that, that is another example, I think, where you see how different measures to, to integrate flexibility into the system, which of course comes on top of um, uh, the expansion of the system. We'll in anyhow, in any case, we'll need expansion of the system and then it's flexibility just to mitigate the effect. Um, uh, where things are not addressed at the moment. And uh, I think we really have to have a different attitude there by DSOs and sorry, also by NIAs to a certain extent um, to, to bring these things forward. And the only movement I, at the moment I see where we, things are really changing and that there's a really dynamic developing towards flexibility is on a European level with the upcoming network code. Okay. Um, I have another question which is coming uh, uh, from, from outside about to you a flow uh, what what are of gem doing to to assess the the lessons from uh, competitive procurement of flexibility services at the distribution level sorry um just what are we doing to to take lessons from or from, from competitive procurement of flexibility services at the specifically at the distribution level at the distribution level um there is a lot of work at the moment in Ofgem around flexibility um so the team that i am in looking um a lot at what the barriers are and why so we we do have proc uh, competitive procurement operating in the uk um i would say that that market is less liquid and less deep than many of us would like and there are many opportunities that people see for that um, procurement, um, particularly for um, assets connected to the distribution level to be able to play across multiple markets and to be able to participate in um, flexibility markets operating both for local congestion and also potentially to aggregate up into um, national markets. There are barriers to that, including things like um, data availability, um, particularly in terms of people being able to see far enough in advance of the likely need for flexibility in order to be able to prepare um, and be ready to join those markets. Um, there is also quite a lot of work at the moment. We have um, a strategy um, directorate that has been set up and they are looking at um, what we refer to as full chain flexibility, which is how to, to really unlock flexibility all the way through um, the electricity sector. So um, really ensuring that everyone can um, access that if they uh, if they want to whether that be through aggregators whether it be directly um, participating in balancing markets or um, contracting with local distribution network operators so flexibility uh, and the um, encouragement of that competitive market where it is the best solution um, is something that we are currently 
um, really very focused on. Okay. Uh, questions keep on keep on coming, and this is really great to see that uh, there is a variety of them, and, and I'm, I'm trying to to take them and, and make some 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 sort of order. But there is something about uh, there is a question from somebody I think all of us know very well. He's our friend Manuel Sanchez, uh, uh, who was formerly with with the GNR. And Manuel is asking. Uh, there's one area in the SO TSO collaboration that we haven't been talking about so far, and this is cybersecurity. Um, uh, what should be done about that, or, or is there anything done about that? I don't know if Michael, you want to say something about this, or or, or, or Sabine, or, or somebody else, cybersecurity who wants to to talk about that, or Torsten. No, no candidates. Well, maybe. Carmen, please. Maybe Manuel could tell us <laughs> best, <laughs> probably. He's the one who knows more. Uh, but just to say, well, that there is, um, there has been a sort of uh, preparatory uh, work being done in cooperation um, between the uh, TSOs and, and DSOs experts, uh, with the, also the um, uh, chair by the, by the commission, by the GNR at the time. And recently, the commission has mandated ACER to draft the, a, fang, a framework guideline on this uh, future network code. Uh, which is expected to be uh, released in July, and then yeah, and then the formal work for uh, developing this uh, network on cyber security will start again with the involvement of, of both um, so NCOE through their experts and uh, then the UDSO entity, which will be in place uh, with the experts from the DSO side. Um, on the on the content, let's say of this uh, network code that's a bit more complicated for me to to explain uh, to you in detail because uh, really, you really must be an expert um, but of course um, it will have implications for both uh, transmission and distribution networks and not only the networks as because everything you. is interconnected mm -hmm. thank you um, any, anybody else wants to intervene on that then I, I, I will uh, I will move to, to, to my next question. It's been, it's been a very long and, and, and difficult task for, for the European Commission to conclude the, the clean energy package. Uh, does the panel think that we should reopen the discussion today and provide a much better definition of the role DSOs should play when it comes, for instance, to, to storage and uh, and charging of uh, electric vehicles. Perhaps, Torsten, you, you may have a view on that. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Um, yeah, um, I, I think in, indeed, um, uh, the, uh, of course, there, there was a lot of work, a lot of discussions, uh, and a, a whole legislative process behind the clean energy package. However, now looking forward to a gas or decarbonization or gas and hydrogen package, um, which will probably be the next step, we'll have to, um, uh, and uh, I'd, I'd love to hear, hear the perspective of Sabina on that. And we'd, we, we'd probably have to address um, a, a number of topics in the electricity directive and regulation again, in order to align it with what we have in gas, in order to um, use this opportunity to incorporate that into the legislative framework, what we've learned in the meantime. And um, uh, for example, uh, as you asked for the entity to align rules for gas and electricity concerning uh, um, DSO entities. So I think the, the upcoming gas package is the opportunity um, to um, take a look again at the results of the um, clean energy package um, in view of um, developments that there have been in the meantime, and especially in view of the necessary integration of electricity and gas systems on a local and regional level. That's um, one of the main tasks I see there as far as DSOs are concerned, that we um, define roles, that we bring systems together, um, that we um, have somebody who facilitates system integration, that we, we define the new role, um, that we have a, 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 some indications on interfaces, how they should be, and so on. If we really want to get systems together and integrate, and that's not just a whole system level perspective that is happening down there 
uh, in the municipalities and the local systems in the regional systems. The gas package is the opportunity to pick up on this and then of course also to adapt the um, uh, some of the rules that there are on the clean energy package. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sabine, you want to, to comment on that? Uh, yeah, maybe shortly. Um, yeah, so for the clean energy packet, as we know, it's, it's now being uh, transposed. The deadline was uh, last year. I think for, 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 of course, this is not like a final word. You will never have like a final electricity uh, legislation. It's, it's like well, work in progress, maybe too big of a word, but uh, after the revision is before the next revision. But uh, of course, there will be some year, some time um, in between and it's uh, it's a bit uh, a lengthy process although recently uh, there are a lot of possibilities uh, to to um, speed up speed it up so uh, to say this for the future of course uh, nothing is uh, set in in stone and and one day sooner and later there will be some revisions coming but i don't see them coming immediately yeah? so we have to work a bit uh, we have to work with what we have um, on the table um, here, um, I, I take note of, of, of what uh, Thorsten uh, says uh, on the gas package. Well, and, and there you, you know the, the commission is really in the middle of it. Um, the commission is expected to make a proposal on gas and on methane um, in, uh, towards the end of this year. Uh, well, I cannot tell you that what will be in there and I think it's not uh, fully clear either, but, but works are, are fully ongoing um, going there. I think maybe, I don't know if the public consultation is still open on this, uh, so, so stakeholders um, can contribute. Um, on storage and electromobility, um, I would like to say we have what is now in the electricity directive and, and I don't see a possibility like changing it now in the context of the gas. So well, fortunately, unfortunately, we have to work with what we have there. Um, I was a bit surprised in the report to say that, um, I don't know if it was related or to electromobility, that it's a bit unclear um, the role of the DSO. I have the impression it's rather clear huh, that the DSO should not get involved. And I mean, there was some idea behind that these are new markets and that there are uh, players outside the DSO which are interested in, in becoming active and that this market should normally develop yeah, as a market and, and should uh, not be uh, DSOs as a regulated entity uh, starting to go into this, only in exceptional um, circumstances, um, especially for the recharging infrastructure for an electromobility. I mean, there is a lot of interest from the private sector as well to, to build um, recharging stations. Of course, we are aware this will not cover all recharging stations that will be needed and to have a full uh, European uh, network. But then there are also, we see, I think, other possibilities which are used in this kind of situa situations, like the authorities can organize a tender and, and can provide a state up for setting up and maybe to a limited extent also for operating the station. So I think this charging point, so I think there are also other ways. and. Yeah, the clean energy package and the commission really starts from this principle as far as possible. This should really be uh, market based because market based usually leads, um, if possible, to more efficient um, outcomes. Um, yeah. No, so and then it was interesting to hear that uh, what Torsten said that the electricity director should be aligned with the gas legislation. I think. Part of the work which is currently ongoing with the gas is also aligning the gas to the electricity um, directive. So it also works in this uh, area, maybe more in the in the, the field or in the provisions related to consumer. Um, but there are also discussions, of course, on, on gas DSOs there. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. Okay, Thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Sabine. I, I'd like to move to the crucial issue of, of, of sector integration. The, the, the Commission has launched uh, the, the sector integration strategy last year, and I, I think it would be interesting to, to, to understand perhaps better the role that uh, DSO uh, can play, DSOs can play in this, uh, in this uh, uh, new approach, assuming that we move into uh, more electricity and, and gas integration should, should we plan and develop networks in, in tandem uh, along each other? Uh, I, I'd first perhaps ask for the UK experience and then I'll, 
I'll, I'll move to, uh, uh, to, to Carmen and, and, and Thorsten uh, and perhaps ask, uh, give the last word to, on that uh, to, to Sabine if she, she wants to add something. So uh, Flo, what, what's, the, what's the UK experience there and, and how do you see that? Um, yeah, no, thank you. It's a, it's a genuinely a very interesting topic. Um, and having spent the last uh, two years um, in Ofgem looking at whole systems policy, um, I actually could could probably go on quite quite at length, but I'll talk a little bit about, I think, three elements of what are happening. So the first is that um, uh, with our different um, governance setup to mainland Europe, we are looking at a potential um, future system operator. Um, and um, some of that is looking at how that could um, look at planning electricity and gas concurrently. Um, I think we we see that um, there are significant potentials for efficiency in how you plan a network. And that doesn't just necessarily relate to the end use of energy, although that's a very important part of it. Um, people at the end of um, end of this, the, the end consumer essentially wants energy. Um, what energy they get, as long as it meets their needs, I think is potentially we found less less critical than the than the requirement of the energy in the first place. But it's also other things in terms of how you build out the networks, how you choose to do things. So you know, if I'm going to dig up the road for um, the electricity cables, I may as well make sure that everything in terms of the gas network is also good down there. So those sort of things can also provide synergies that can really be important. So it can be much more than just the end use of energy. Um, in terms of how we've approached it, um, we, uh, we have the separate gas and electricity acts. What we have done in the Rio 2 packages is that we are looking at incentive options. So there are incentives for the network operators to propose uh, innovations, propose options and propose processes and actions where they can show that they are pro providing better efficiency and an overall better service to their customers. Um, and there are ways that that can then be accommodated within um, the price controls. Um, and this can be quite powerful in terms of the use of the, the TOTEX mechanism, because um, if one of them, you know, they're not only looking at capital investments, operational investments that, that organize between the, the different networks can be quite, um, can be easily um, accounted for. Uh, and then the last is that we actually have, uh, so the Energy Network Association in the UK um, have a working group which is already looking at whole energy systems. So there are gas and electricity network operators and uh, they come together in that working group um, and have been doing so for uh, almost, for more than a year, almost two years now in looking at what options they have. Um, and some of the, the early identification is, for example, in information exchange, because the first thing that happens if there's a spike in the requirement for electricity, one of the first things that happens is, you know, your fast reaction uh, gas um, generators come on. So you kind of pass your need for electricity as a hit straight through to your gas network. Um, and if the electricity network can see that hit coming but the gas network hasn't, then that can have very big effects on you know, what, their, what their plans were. So looking at how to make sure that their forecasting um, and their expectations for use. And for example, if the gas network knows it's going to be squeezed at that time, making sure that the electricity network knows that because that might actually affect whether some of those um, fast reaction um, assets are going to choose to come on because the price may be such that it actually disincentivizes them from doing so. So there are some quite easy upfront things that we can see and then some, you know, much more complicated but still very beneficial options for um, efficiency by, you know, really looking at it and saying, well, is the end result gas and electricity or is the end result energy? And if the end result is energy, then how best do we deliver that for the consumer? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, same question to uh, to Carmen and and to Thorsten. Uh, uh, what role can 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 the DSO play in the new uh, sector integration approach? And uh, and should we plan and 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 develop networks in, in in tandem? Carmen, briefly on that. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, I think DSOs really are very well placed to play their role on system integration because system integration is mostly will take place mostly at the local uh, distribution, in that case, distribution uh, level. Uh, already, there is the case in many countries like Germany, Austria, Eastern countries, some of the Nordics, where uh, distribution operators run both networks, uh, electricity and gas, and don't forget this to heating because we, we tend to forget about heating, but it plays uh, also a very important role, uh, uh, in particular in buildings when we talk about decarbonization. So they are uh, per se, let's say, already uh, system <laughs> integrated operators, if you want to call like that, even in within GEOT, we, uh, since uh, its foundation, we have both electricity, gas and combined uh, members. So we can say we are a, a system integrated association, if you want to like that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and I think um, as Thornton said, uh, the, the new gas package is a, is a very good opportunity, but also um, uh, there are some concerns whether a legislator is forward, uh, has a forward-looking approach or just copy-paste from the electricity uh, to the gas, and then we have um, similar uh, provisions uh, for certain roles of, of the DSOs. And also, uh, together with that, there is a review of the already the um, renewable directive and the energy efficiency directive, which also um, will partly cover or try to adapt to a more uh, system integration approach from the European Commission side. So. Uh, let's hope for that. For that, um, in terms, I already mentioned at the beginning of um, network planning, we think the synergies could be absolutely beneficial for the efficiency of the of the energy system, and and, and it's time, of course. Electricity has gone ahead because of of the challenges because. Of course, uh, electrification uh, will cover to a, a large extent clearly um, demand, but we uh, now we all agree not only. So we need the other energy carriers to to complement and to bring them along and to uh, yeah take advantage of the synergies between them. Yes, thanks. Is Thank I may add to that. Thank you. Um, if, if I may add to, to that, um, and, and of course, to, um, uh, telling um, Zavina what, what I meant, of course, is aligning gas with electricity, not the other way around, certainly. Um, uh, yes, we need to have a framework, and we should have it uh, on a European level, and now's the time to address that, to bring together not only system planning and development, but also system operation of um, electricity, gas, hydrogen, and of course, of district heating networks. That's one thing that's regulated with regulated. But I think if we would want to have truly integrated energy systems at a local and regional level, we need to be, go beyond regulated. And we need to have a function of somebody facilitating this integration going to competitive market parties. And for example, providing um, uh, incentives, always market compatible um, to have flexibility at the right locations or to um, have energy to focus energy efficiency measures on where it really matters if you want to develop certain concepts for heating, for example. So this is a hugely complex task. Um, uh, the more I get into it, the more excited I'm about it. Um, take a look at what, what E.ON, for example, did for the city of Essen with 600,000 inhabitants, where we try to have future forward-looking planning, bringing together um, all three district heating, gas and electricity, and having a concept uh, to, down to the single building, what to do, where and who, whom to provide incentives with until 2050. I think if we don't do that, um, we'll not only lose a lot of efficiency, but we'll also lose the um, opportunity of a truly integrated energy system. So yes, it's regulated, but it's also regulated and competitive. And it's a task that should be addressed in the framework probably of the uh, gas package. Thanks. Thank you, Thorsten. I, I have a, we, we, we need to, to start uh, wrapping up. Um, I, I would like to, to ask uh, Thorsten, Carmen, and, and, and Flo, and, and, and after perhaps Sabine to come and, you know, in one minute each, uh, what are your, your, your three main priorities uh, that you would put forward 
uh, to facilitate the, the transition towards a more, a more active uh, DSO. Uh, let's perhaps start with the, with, the with the UK regulator, Flo. Okay, one minute. Um, so um, I think the first thing I would say is that one of the major challenges is uh, visibility of the network. It is difficult to have an active network if you uh, do not have visibility of it. This is challenging because obviously it will be very expensive to roll out visibility across the entire network and therefore it needs to be targeted to areas that are most important. But um, the simple fact that we do not always know what is even exporting or importing at different points of the, the distribution network would make the idea of an active system quite challenging. So that'd be my first one. Um, and then for a lack of time and also for importance, I'm going to use two on data. Um, which is to say um, that uh, this is both the data and information that distribution network operators or system operators um, have are able to process internally and share then externally with people who are also looking to uh, use the system and support the system um, is a, another major challenge. Um, but I'm aware that every time we say data, it becomes a black box that you open and um, everyone wants, you know, kind of everything. So those would be the two things though, I think that are very important to a system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carmen, same question. One minute, three main priorities max to facilitate the transition towards a more active DSO. So first, um, innovative regulation that makes equally attractive uh, investments in conventional and innovative uh, technology and regulators shouldn't be afraid to review existing legislation if, if that one uh, shows that jeopardize system efficiency. Secondly, stop working on silos, electricity, gas, heat. This is time for uh, uh, looking into the synergies. Third, give a chance to the UDSL entity uh, to enhance the role of uh, distribution system operators in Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, Torsten, same question to you. Uh, yeah, I, I've had time to think now, actually. So it's first, maybe now, in uh, also, also on, the, uh, on the timeline, um, first is, um, enable flexibility, unleash the competitive potential through a network code on distributed flexibility. The second one is indeed um, address the integration of systems, electricity, gas, hydrogen, heat through a proper framework in European legislation. Um, and the third one I, I'd love to see is um, all uh, enable um, more opportunities and more incentive for um, innovative research and um, then developing new procedures by DSOs. Okay, thank you. What do you take from all that, Sabine? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, well, uh, maybe also change a bit to what are the priorities also for the, for the Commission in, in this area. Um, as already mentioned, we see the flexibility markets as a, as a very um, congestion management at a DSO level as a very important uh, issue um, and the planned work on a network code for demand side flexibility um, that is hopefully um, starting um, soon. Um, uh, then also, I think the, the issue of uh, data and um, access to data and making the, um, well, the, the DSO should be like, a, a, have a neutral role in this and providing access to data to, to, to uh, relevant um, stakeholders. This we see as important. What we haven't discussed yet so, so much is also the regulation to like give incentives uh, to DSOs to um, use flexibility. Uh, I think this is a field to look into as well. So it's this discussion about about um, being remunerated on or regulated on a capex basis, whether that we are versus a two tax or, or op, um, more taking into account the operating expenses and not only the capital and um, um, capital um, investments. Uh, investments into the physical grid. And, and then I think as mentioned by, by Flo, I think the observability, observa, observability of the grid as well, of course, you cannot do uh, have flexibility markets and um, functioning if you don't know what's happening in your grid. So I think this is an important thing. Um, 
Yeah, so this would be thank my you. points. And I will have to leave, unfortunately, in one sure. minute. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for this. Uh, I think this, this puts an end to, to, the, to the panel. Before, before uh, I would like to, to give the floor to, to, uh, to, uh, um, to the authors, or at least to, to two of them, Monica and, and, and Michael, to, to ask you very, very briefly, because time is, 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 is pressing, what are your, 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 your main takeaways, perhaps in, in one or two minutes each, too, um, from this discussion? Uh, Monica, please. Um, my main takeaway is that we've seen examples where a variety of uh, economic agents can cooperate productively, and I hope that is the future for the development of uh, a new energy system if uh, um, companies and regulators uh, talk to each other and find ways of promoting innovation and efficiency. Okay, thank you very much. Michael, final word for you. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, I think we should stop calling them the fourth energy package. Let's let's start with the first net zero package um, and sort of because I think the commission now needs to reset from a, a competitive timeline in energy to a net zero consistent timeline in energy. Um, and I think I would emphasize something that we say in the report, which is that much more cost benefit analysis needs to be done of uh, new mechanisms at the distribution level to demonstrate which um, aspects of um, the uh, the DSO actually do bring benefit to final customers. Um, because we observe lots of activity, lots of innovation, lots of projects, but uh, what actually brings benefit to final customers, that needs careful regulatory evaluation especially at the whole system level. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this will be the final world. I, I, I just want to, to, first of all, to thank the, the authors of this uh, brilliant report, Michael Pollitt, Monica Giulietti, Karim Anaya, uh, colleagues, you've done a, a really great job and, and I, I, I want to thank you very much for, for that. I, I want to thank also our panelists, uh, Carmen Jimeno, uh, Sabine Krom, uh, Flo Silver, uh, Torsten Knopp. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors for this project, uh, Geod, Aeon, uh, Bundesnetzagentur, uh, Ahera, uh, and uh, I want to thank all the viewers. We, we still have many goodies uh, which are coming in, in terms of reports, in terms of dissemination exercises. Uh, these are being done by, by the fantastic CER team, who is also uh, running this uh, this show for the moment, uh, and I I, I I just want to mention uh, uh, John Mac uh, Sweeney and uh, uh, and his team of, of colleagues. So thank you to all of you, and uh, we'll meet you soon. Take care of yourself and take care of others. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>